So yeah, the books the books are kind of laid out according to a preconceived plan, and uh, I've been following it. <laughs> I've been following it rather rigorously. It may it may look to be haphazard, but I think uh, I think for the readers that get into the books, they'll see how they all kind of tie together. Oh, I, I I can definitely provide a personal uh, testimony to that fact. I've, I've <laughs> followed everything right along until just your most recent release, which I haven't had a chance to get to yet. But I'm sure that when I do, it's going to be just like your the, the other work beforehand, where I'm, I'm just compelled to read until I finish. It, it's it's just fascinating. I I think what I appreciate most about your style is that um, in in a field uh, where there are so many researchers who mm. They seem to be unable to avoid the temptation of becoming sensationalistic or, or mm-hmm. you know, provocative with with their approach. I, I find that you speak with a, a voice of of reason, of clarity, uh, a rigorously applied uh, methodology with the research and, and documentation. And well, thank uh, you. Well, it, it just seems to represent, uh, you know, for those who have not, for for some reason, whatever that might be, not become familiar with your work yet, uh, they definitely need to uh, to get in there. So um, what I had hoped to do with our interview today is really focus mm-hmm. on sort of that, that middle period, beginning with the Reich of the mm-hmm. Black Sun and right. your works uh, in that line. And w- Dr. Farrell, what I've found, uh, I like to, each time we bring up subject matter, when it's not in and around our immediate uh, events or timeline. Mm-hmm. I always like to try to uh, throw a few thoughts out there that get people's minds clicking right up front. Mm-hmm. And in this case, I think many Americans, uh, when they hear World War II come up, they have a flashback to junior high history class and to a few of them, <laughs> <laughs> and, and they'd like to partition their mind away and think of that as ancient history. And I think they they miss the <laughs> pervasive connections. Impl- implications, mm-hmm. ramifications of what that time period didn't just mean then, what it means today. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And we'll be talking, I'm very sure, through the course of our conversation about the SS, for example, which mm-hmm. many of the listeners, you know, have some context for, for what the SS was or, uh, you know, meant as a part of Nazi Germany. In my research, I found that in 1945, the, the size, the scale, or the scope of the SS had reached 1.25 million, 1,250,000. Mm-hmm. So I did a little more research to try to provide some context for our listeners. If we take, uh, from today's estimates, all of the employees of General Electric plus GM plus Ford, let's throw in all of the employees of the FBI and the CIA, mm-hmm. let's throw in all the employees of Microsoft and Apple, mm-hmm. and we're still not there yet. That gets us to 925000 so when we add in IBM, that puts us over the top, 1.35 right. million. Right. That's an awful lot of boots on the ground and uh, a lot yeah, of it videos. Is. <laughs> <laughs> How about if we turn you loose there? Well, you're quite right to, to point out that the SS was not only an elite organization, but it was very large. And uh, the other thing that, that I would add to to your remarks is that your your analogy not only to the CIA, in other words, to an intelligence agency of of the government of, of of the federal government, is correct because the German Reich was was like this country was a federated state, um, and and the SS was definitely an agency of its intelligence organs, and in fact, it was the largest. Uh, the Reichsführer High Topdampt was was. Beyond, uh, beyond all other German intelligence agencies, quite definitely the largest and, and quite thoroughly SS. So that analogy is correct. The other, the other, uh, analogy that you're drawing there is to a, a large and for all intents and purposes multinational corporation. And this too is quite correct, at least insofar as the SS had its own private economy. Um, it was, quite literally not only a state within a state but it was also an economy within an economy it was mm-hmm. it was a huge part of of the german war machine and it was plugged very directly into the other major facets of of the nazi war economy like uh, ig farben and and uh, 
Thyssenkrupp and, and all of those very, very large uh, German corporations. And, and we have to understand something else, and, and you, bring up, you bring up yet another analogy or imply another uh, analogy about the SS. And this is precisely the fact that it was so large that the idea that it simply ceased to exist on May 1st, 1945, with the assumption of, of uh, Grand Admiral Rader, uh, pardon me, Grand Admiral Dönitz to, to the leadership of the Third Reich and then the subsequent surrender a week later. The idea that this organization simply ceased to exist with all of its vast financial resources, all of its deep, deep penetrations into not only German intelligence but the, the intelligence structure of, of post-war Europe and the idea that it simply ceased to exist with all of its financial resources, which were truly, truly mind-boggling. I mean, we we have to remember, and I point this out in, in a book that I, I wrote in 2008 called The Nazi International, that IG Farben alone was such a huge, gigantic, multinational company. I mean, it was really, truly the first uh, gargantuanly sized multinational company in history. I see. Well, it was only finally liquidated in the year 2003. <laughs> so, you know, in other words, it was so huge it took that long to sort out all the tangle of of overlapping license agreements and patent arrangements and so on and so forth that that IG Farben controlled. So the idea that 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 the SS as an organization and therefore the idea that that the Nazi party or its ideology simply ceased to function on, on May 7th, 1945. <laughs> it's just sort of <laughs> stupid when you get right down to it. You're exactly right. And, you know, uh, when I encounter folks uh, who have not yet had a chance to really dive into your work uh, mm-hmm. in any depth, uh, the mm-hmm. way that I try to build their intrigue, to you know, to compel them to, to dive in, you know, uh, is is by creating a sort of another analogy, uh, comparing it uh, to today. I, I, right. I use examples of, you know, let's say, for example, that, that China or Russia, some entity, uh, made a, a, a swift and concerted attack on the United States. Mm-hmm. And somehow, although this seems far-fetched, but, but somehow uh, their, their position and their advantage was significant enough that the United States were to uh, declare military defeat. So as a nation... Right. And yet, uh, most Americans are, are, are pretty quick to realize that even if that were to happen, probably several branches of the military itself, let alone our uh, uh, intelligence community, the NSA, the CIA, the FBI, mm-hmm. all of these would have plans well in advance of that moment of yes. defeat or surrender to go underground and continue the resistance, so to speak, uh, you know, into the future. And that's only right. just our, our recognized agencies. We also know that even our civilian base, there'd be large, you know, groupings of people who also exactly. would, would try to take that resistance underground. And so, um, it, it, it might seem provocative on the surface to consider the question: What if the West, the Allied powers, really did not win outright World War II? It might seem provocative on the surface, but it's it's really not a sensationalistic question, is it? No, it isn't, and and this really is this really is the argument that I've been trying to pursue, the the overall argument that I've been trying to pursue in those Nazi books, because you're precisely correct, and as as I point out in in the Nazi International, and and many others other other authors have pointed this out as well, the Nazis did have uh, several strategic evacuation and and post war plans. Uh, the unfortunate thing is, is that allied historians tend to think that because they found this or that particular plan or closed down this or that particular Nazi front, that they were successful in shutting the entire thing down. Mm-hmm. Well, it doesn't take you very long to investigate certain goings on in Latin America to, <laughs> to conclude <laughs> that this is, this is about the farthest thing from the truth that, that, that there is. The, the, the post-war plans of the Nazis were were very ingenious, um, and and they were executed with with typical German efficiency. And they they succeeded, in my opinion, in creating the the infrastructure of a post-war international organization. A kind of I, I like to call it an extraterritorial state, Antonin, because that that I think is effectively what what the post-war allies were dealing with. They were dealing with with a multi-headed hydra. Whose, whose presence was everywhere and whose center was nowhere. In other words, they were dealing with something that they couldn't eradicate 
uh, it, it became, as you as you so aptly observed, it became an underground organization, mm. and to a certain extent, it kind of closed the historical circle. Because if you look back at some of the origins of, of the Nazi party itself, that party was to a certain extent midwifed into existence by underground organizations, by, oh, by yeah. secret societies and occult organizations. So in a certain sense, it returned to its roots after the war. It, it, it went back underground. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now, you know, uh, where you have arrived at at this moment is mm -hmm. a, a thread that, that what, I'd, what I'd like to do is, is in our conversation, come, come back to that point, that moment in mm -hmm. history, and, and, and follow that thread. But what I find most intriguing about your work, Dr. Farrell, is that you know, the, the, the geopolitical machinations of man's and humanity to man is more so, in my view, a kind of a byproduct of your work. It, it seems to me that, that your work begins, its origin points begin from the technologies, from the sciences. Yes. And uh, that's what I very much appreciate about also your work in this, in this period, beginning with Reich of the Black Sun. And I want to throw out for the listening audience, uh, here's another uh, kind of a mind experiment or a thought experiment. Uh, what I'm really trying to do is, is get your attention, folks, and help you to realize how significant this is. I think a lot of, of Americans, if they were uh, posed with the question, uh, who was who the most important scientist uh, of the 20th century? Probably, I would guess most Americans would, would probably either land on the name of Albert Einstein or maybe even Stephen Hawking, since he's contemporary. Right. And yet, uh, when you when you ask the average person, uh, when when was the theory of relativity produced? They don't realize that it's already more than a hundred years ago, yeah. and that Albert Einstein he wasn't the only smart guy walking around in his day, was he? Oh no, by no means, by no means, and. You're, you're quite right to point out that, that Einstein has become more or less the icon of, of contemporary physics. And in fact, there are physicists that will quite boldly come out, although they're certainly in the minority, but there are physicists that will quite boldly come out and say that that's precisely the problem because it's been more or less a, of a dead end. And what I try to pursue, Antonin, in, in the, in the Nazi series of books is the idea that Nazi Germany in throwing off the relativistic paradigm. Well, the way that most academics interpret that is that Nazi Germany locked itself into uh, a cul-de-sac from which it could not escape, and that's the reason they, they lost the race for the bomb, that's the reason that they lost the war, and so on and so forth. But the actual historical record, when you, when you look at all of the achievements of, of Nazi Germany, and let's understand here, you know, Germany at that time was, was a nation about the size of the state of Texas, okay? <laughs> okay. So in other words, you, you are looking at a technological explosion during the 12 year existence of the Third Reich that really is without parallel in human history. Mm. And I think part of the answer to that lies in the fact that, yes, Nazi Germany threw off the standard paradigm of the physics of the day. And that meant, inevitably, that they were going to have far more failures than they were going to have successes. But it also meant that they did not lock themselves into a box and, and more or less were forced to think outside of the box, not only in terms of their theorizing, but in terms of their engineering of the theories that they were coming up with. So by the same token, while they had some stunning and colossal failures, <laughs> I do mean that in, in the fullest sense of the word, while they had some stunning and colossal failures of, of the scientific mind and method, by the same token, if you read certain reports and, and certain documents that I produce in that Nazi series, they also had some tremendous and brilliant successes that for the most part have been kept more or less out of the public eye ever since. Precisely. And that's the that's the scary part of it because that in turn, as you as you aver, that in turn means that this technological gold mine that the Third Reich represented also represented not only the largest technolo technology transfer in history from Germany to, to the Allies after the end of the war. It also represented, if you grant the proposition that there is a post-war Nazi organization that is, for all intents and purposes, 
extraterritorial and that it has huge financial resources, which it did, and also had maintained its control over some of that technology and over the scientists producing